Good morning, uh, and I guess good afternoon, and maybe even good evening to people from around the world. Uh, these are my disclosures, a number of which are pertinent to the presentation today. So this is what my practice looks like. I have uh, pediatric deformity, uh, idiopathic scoliosis, congenital scoliosis, adult degenerative scoliosis with sagittal plane malalignments, severe sagittal plane malalignment. And this is a representation of why navigation has been helpful to me. Uh, I know Larry Linke does most things freehand, but I can't put pedicle screws in a pedicle that looks like that with high reliability without uh, adjunctive technology. And this was a patient that's not uncommon, a neuromuscular scoliosis patient with very small pedicles. You can see the intrathecal baclofen pump, and you can see the pedicle sizes that we are dealing with, and that with this technology, we are able to reliably get good segmental fixation across these small and uh, deformed pedicles. So you say, well, it, it takes a long time. Well, here is an unedited video in terms of our workflow and how we do it. So we've exposed the spine, put the reference frame on at the caudal aspect. I use a navigate it all to find my start point. I use a, a burr to create a cortical defect. I then place the all and that uh, we tend to use a mallet and mallet it in. Uh, in very small pedicles, we'll tend to use a drill instead or if the patient's myelopathic. Uh, and as we're doing this, I'm now judging what is the length of my screw uh, based off of that nav screen. And also then as I go to the taps, I'll put the tap in and that my partner has the tap ready to go. Uh, as we start advancing the tap, we'll upsize the CAD file on the tap to say, okay, how big a screw can it accept? And since I started using uh, navigation technology, my screws are bigger and longer uh, than they were before the technology. And so we can reliably do that. And so that's the, that's the amount of time that it literally takes us to do, the, uh, uh, to do, to do a screw placement. And so this is that patient, and you can see uh, that this is what the outcome looks like. Not a particularly challenging curve, but representative of what we're doing here. So why bother with navigation? Well, deformity alters the anatomy, and we put in a lot of screws in deformity patients. Pediatric deformity specifically will alter the pedicle size and morphology, and the, that scoliosis then causes the spinal cord to hug the concave pedicle. I like the latest uh, concept that Larry Linke shared with us about type ABC cords where uh, the cord may be hugged and deformed against that concave pedicle. And that the question then becomes, what is your tolerance for potentially causing an avoidable paraplegia? And that what we found is that we can apply greater corrective forces with optimized screw purchase and in 11 years, my return to OR rate, actually it's more than that now, it's actually uh, 14 years, my return to OR rate for screw malposition has been zero. I do have an intraoperative reposition rate, which is probably in the one to 2% range. So this is a representation of the advantage of uh, navigation technology. So this is a revision of a previous fusion and having to put a pedicle screw at L1 through a fusion mass. And this screw is perfectly, or this trajectory is perfectly positioned. This trajectory puts the screw out medial. This trajectory puts the screw out lateral. How good are you with freehand technology and can you get that in place with that little tolerance for error? And that we know in, uh, that scoliotic pedicles, the concave pedicle is much smaller uh, and much higher risk because the cord is sitting right here. Uh, that uh, there's been a classification scheme and that we seem to pretty reliably uh, be able to uh, place the uh, screws even in type C and D pedicles. I don't know that navigation is necessary for type A pedicles, uh, but as you get to the type D pedicles, things are different. So how good is good enough? Is 100% accuracy achievable? What is an acceptable rate of malposition or neurologic compromise or vascular injury? And what amount of OR time and radiation exposure is justified in order to solve these problems? So the best data that exists is in a series of meta-analyses, and these meta-analyses compare pedicle screw placement with navigation to without, and there's no question that that improves the accuracy of screw placement. Uh, this is true in both pediatric and adult uh, patient populations. And that the meta-analyses show that navigation is favored 
uh, over non-navigation for screw accuracy. And this is true in the thoracic spine as well as the lumbar spine. And that the operative time actually has not been shown to be different. Blood loss has also probably decreased a little bit. And that I think this is a key point that if you're putting in 11 screws, navigation will help you avoid one screw malposition. Now, screw malpositions range from inconsequential to catastrophic, and not all screw malpositions are problematic, and so I acknowledge that. In a, a children's hospital of Philadelphia, they did a study, some of the surgeons navigated, and some of them just did an O-arm spin after, after the screw placement to look at uh, screw accuracy, and what they found was that screw removal or re repositioning rate was 0 0.6 in the navigated population and 4.9% in the non-navigated population. There are potential sources of error in, the na in navigation, and this is experience-based rather than literature-based. And the most common issue is uh, banging the frame and dislodging the reference frame. Intersegmental motion can also affect the accuracy. And then occasionally we'll get instrument deformation where if I try to put an awl across the uh, an S2AI uh, screw trajectory and as you're crossing the SI joint, I've deformed a number of awls. We usually blame the system, but that's rarely the cause. And that how do you check this? Well, we, we will find a known point and check the accuracy of what's being shown on the screen with what we see uh, in the patient. We actually did a study comparing virtual to actual, and that uh, we found that we were within about two degrees of accuracy uh, comparing our virtual to our actual, uh, and this was in about 240 screws. And I think an important concept is what does two degrees mean? Two degrees is probably acceptable. If you have a five degree error, that's probably uh, beginning to become more problematic. And so that's part of uh, the issue for us going forward is how accurate are we uh, with these technologies. Our early experience and our early part of the learning curve, we reviewed uh, our first 2,500 screws and that our highest rate of repositioning was in the mid thoracic spine. I think we've gotten better uh, over time on that, but this is true in both kids and adults, uh, but that our accuracy uh, was different in children versus adults. Again, not surprising given the small pedicles of children, uh, but that what we found is that if your pedicle size was less than four millimeters, that's where we tended to have the higher rate of malposition. And we, we do a check spin after our screws are placed uh, to confirm their accuracy, and that's what our repositioning rate comes from. So we've had a 0% return to OR, uh, because of screw malposition, and the best information I can find in the literature says it occurs 0.8 to 4.3%. Uh, we've also looked at it in congenital scoliosis, and uh, these kinds of patients, it's particularly challenging. And one of the key points is that I tend to be a uh, put a screw in every pedicle kind of guy, and that uh, about 19% of the time in the congenitals, there was not a pedicle that could have a screw placed in it. So we had about a 19% dropout rate. And that we've also shown that it, we've decreased our uh, facet joint violation uh, in doing it with uh, perk screws, and our perk screw accuracy rate was better than the literature uh, meta-analysis. Radiation concerns, there is radiation associated with this, uh, and how much is acceptable, that's an uh, uh, ongoing and challenging question. And as the technology continues to improve, I think we're going to see the radiation doses coming down. Uh, each O-arm spin at the settings that we were using was about the equivalent of 35 seconds of fluoro. So navigation results in more accurate screw placement. It doesn't seem to take longer. It doesn't increase blood loss. Um, it does require capital investment, and there is increased radiation exposure to the patient. So again, my personal experience, 0% return to the OR in uh, now 14 years takes us about three to five minutes uh, per screw, including the scan time, and that's continuing to decrease. Uh, and our institutional ability to highly place uh, perk screws is there, and it's allowed highly reliable ileocecal screw implantation. So to be honest about cases, here is a case done uh, about a year ago, and uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, screws going in, no problem on the lower segment. Upper segment, screws are placed. Uh, they look reasonably okay on the 2D imaging. And then here's the honest truth about it, that at the upper end of the 
uh, navigated segment that sometimes we do have a malposition, uh, and that was repositioned, uh, no neurologic compromise. You can see the screw is now accurately placed, and then here are the uh, post-op images of that particular patient. So uh, it improves accuracy. It's not perfect. Uh, I believe in trust but verify. Uh, there is increased radiation exposure to the patient, decreased radiation exposure to the surgical team, and you've got to do what's right in your hands. And for me and for my patients, it's navigation. And then I was asked to talk about spinal pelvic fixation uh, in deformity surgery. And so we're going to talk about why do we do that, what are the biomechanics, and then what are the options. All right, so the best article on this is uh, uh, this article, which has great pictures from Heiko Kohler. Uh, the problems are pseudarthrosis and uh, screw failure. The trajectories, the best bone in the sacrum is in the S1 end plate and body. The ilium has multiple long paths. Uh, S1 pedicle screws should be immediately convergent to be optimized. And that looks something like this from the uh, older data. Uh, the sacral promontory gives us a doubled insertional torque compared to uh, a conventional trajectory. Here is the history or evolution of pelvic fixation, moving now to stacked screws and quad rods, uh, and then even uh, SI joint uh, fusion simultaneously and multiple points of pelvic fixation. This is the best biomechanical study that exists, which shows that there is, uh, uh, if you get anterior to the pivot point, that the uh, performance of the anchors is much better. Uh, as we put screws in, we find that as we get at about 80 millimeters, we see an increased insertional torque of the screws as we hit this second narrow point, and the bigger screws have increased insertional torque compared to the smaller screws. When we fuse the spine, we markedly increase the stress on the SI joint, uh, but when we fuse the SI joint, we don't really increase the stress on the spine or the hip very much. Why do we need pelvic fixation? Well, the more levels we fuse, the higher the level of rate of pseudarthrosis at the lumbosacral junction. Uh, so I just searched this morning to see where we are on S2AI screws, and there's 123 publications on that. If we look at finite element modeling, we see that the highest screw strain is in the offset connector and at the uh, head-neck junction. Uh, in S2AI screws, it's where we cross the SI joint. And this has been repeated in several other finite element studies as well. The complication rate for S2 ALR iliac screws seems to be lower than that of iliac screws in several meta-analyses. And this includes the pediatric and adult populations. Uh, and the typical failure modes are implant failure, screw breakage, prominence, and infection. Uh, painful prominence is an issue. Uh, halo formation does occur. So what about traditional uh, Offset connectors, well, you can get a large channel of bone for a conventional iliac screw. It's relatively easy to do freehand and you can place large screws. The disadvantage is the dissection and connectors are all, always fiddly and they tend to be a little bit prominent. There are strategies to minimize that by recessing the screw into the ilium or putting it underneath the iliac crest. Multiple iliac screws can be done. You must start low in the teardrop and place the most scrotal screw just above the sciatic notch. And the next one is just below the iliopectineal line, uh, such as in this case example. And then when I do this, as you can see on this navigation screen, I'm really trying to stay right just above the sciatic notch. That then gives us more room for placement of the second screw. And if you're a fluoro-based uh, uh, screw placement person, this is what your fluoro shots should look like. Uh, and then you can use a kickstand rod in addition to the stacked uh, uh, S2AI screws. Recently, there's uh, been a publication talking about S2AI screw failure. Uh, this is the first one really looking at this in a uh, reliable fashion. And they showed that you see set plugs popping off and rods dislodging along with breakage at the uh, tulip head screw shaft junction and where the screw crosses the SI joint. And that they did a very nice finite element model study that shows that if you use this favorite angled screw, the extrusion force across the set plug is markedly increased. Um, we've had a similar experience in Minnesota and our, our experience is under review currently. So we had about six out of 125 cases or 5% that failed uh, acutely within the first uh, six weeks post-op. And the failure factors were uh, large deformity corrections, 
and transitional lumbosacral junction uh, anatomy, where they tend to fracture through the transitional vertebra. Uh, emerging data suggesting that vacuum phenomenon in the SI joint may be an indication for uh, doing something more, and that uh, Inoki and others have shown us that the more levels we fuse, the greater the incidence of new onset of SI joint pain. There are several biomechanical studies showing that if we fuse the SI joint simultaneously, it reduces the bending strain in the screws, and that this is true in both a cadaver model and in a finite element model, and that we can place uh, SI fusion devices across the SI joint similar to our stacked S2AI screws. Again, stay low in the notch, just above the notch for the first implant, and then the next implant goes below the iliopectineal line, looks something like this. And here is uh, an example patient with that done. There is a multi-center randomized controlled trial to tell us is this the right thing to do or not. We don't have emerging data yet. Uh, I can tell you I'm now up to having done 27 patients like this. This is our initial case series that was submitted for publication. And three out of my first 38 implants, I did have to reposition intraoperatively. This is a representative implant that was malpositioned in a patient with a BMI of about 46. <laughs> uh, Pelvic insufficiency fractures are an issue and that we uh, uh, can nicely fix these and stabilize and get these patients going and out of bed. Uh, I like to use through and through screws in order to do that and navigation allows me to do that. So in summary, we wanna optimize our S1 screws. If more than three levels of fusion, probably do iliac fixation. Uh, greater than 80 millimeters in length and eight millimeters in diameter is what we want to achieve. S2AI seems to have a lower rate of revision. Stack screws are possible and the role of concomitant SI fusion remains to be seen. Thank you very much. I'm now muted. Hang on, I'm muted. We can we can hear you, Pat. We can hear you. Okay, Hi, Dave, that's incredible. And for the audience out there, you've heard one of the you've heard one of the world experts. I got to. Okay, is that better? Yes. And uh, I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about um, just your experience with navigation and how how you have progressed along. Do you do any non-navigated instrumentation cases at all now? Uh, only if uh, the nav is not available and that happened once in the last 10 years. Okay, <laughs> that answers the question. Because a lot of people out there, they're saying, oh, I use it for this and that and I use it for various different uh, applications. But I think that answers the question. And I'm so, very- so, Pat, I, think there's a, I think there's a key concept in there that some people say, I only use it for the tough cases. Well, if you only use it to, for the tough cases, then you don't, then your team's not good at it. And so that we decided that we were going to use it routinely and that by doing that, our team has gotten incredibly efficient and things just move and flow very nicely. And so when we have a really difficult case, there's no surprise, there's no change in workflow. We just do what we do. Okay. That, I, I'm applauding you because I think that's just incredible and, and it's helping advance, you know, the utilization of technology. And I can say in my own practice, we do it for pretty much every navigated case and I'm using it more in um, non instrumented cases where we use navigation for decompressions or some things that we simply need a better way to see inside of the spine on the other side of what the surface of exposure is. I mean, far lateral discs and things like that. I mean, it's a little off the topic here, but I mean, that's just looking at some of the different applications of navigation that I think are, are useful. Um, I do have another question about uh, S2 AI failures. Have you looked independently on uh, the size of the patients, large patients? I see yes. a few of them in your, in your group that are pretty large looking patients, and we all have those. And I'm just wondering if that actually is a factor all by itself. Yeah, so in our, uh, so we had 120, we had a, a propensity match cohort, and we did a univariate and multivariate uh, regression analysis, and the only things that came up positive, so we only had six patients who failed, was the magnitude of the deformity correction, and then the transitional anatomy. Uh, in a larger series, so we have a multi-center uh, con consolidation of data that we're trying to do to see if we can nuance things out better. Uh, but it's clear that the bigger patients have a forward shifted center of gravity and they do, uh, they do put a lot of load on the, uh, on the implants. Maybe, maybe a correlation directly with BMI. You know, that's probably the, that's a metric that you can actually analyze. So 
Yeah, and I don't know if it's BMI or total weight uh, as you think about the four supplied. So you may have a you may have a skinny uh, uh, three hundred pound uh, uh, athlete, and I think they're still going to bring a lot of load. <laughs> okay, that's great, um, Danielle. You have any questions for us? David, David, that's incredible. Um, appreciate you always uh, sharing your experience with it. just a, an incredible contribution to uh, complex spine surgery, of which you're truly a master. And thank you very much for being here today.